This is Dr. Robert J. Shifflett of World Prophetic Ministry, Colton, California, introducing Dr. Howard C. Estep, known as America's Prophecy Preacher. Dr. Estep has completed a verse-by-verse study of 1 Peter. Dr. Estep taught these lessons in the new auditorium of World Prophetic Ministry here in Colton, California. Now, here is Dr. Estep with lesson number one, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, we shall begin our study. We're entitling this lesson, Confidence During Exile, and uh, we're covering 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 21, and we have a key verse, and the key verse is number 3. Number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's our key verse, and the reason for this lesson, that Christians, knowing they have been chosen by God for a magnificent future, may rejoice in this hope in the midst of earthly trials and tribulations knowing that we have been chosen by God because of our new birth for a magnificent future. We know that, that we may rejoice in this hope in the midst of all of our earthly trials, tribulations, and disappointments. have a lesson outline. It's in three parts. One, confident hope. Confident hope. Part A, B, and C, A, chosen by God, 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 4, B, kept by God, verse 5, C, tested by God, verses 6 through 9. The second part, predicted grace, verses 10 through 12. The third part, holy living, A, future glory. Verse 13, B, divine command, verses 14 through 16, and lastly, C, costly redemption, verses 17 through 21. Shall we begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Peter is giving us his credentials here. This is chosen by God. He's establishing who he is. And it's believed that this was written from Babylon, the ancient city of Babylon, approximately 60 A.D., been written by Simon Peter the fisherman. He's establishing that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle was someone who had seen Christ in person and were familiar with his works. This word apostle is one who is sent forth, meaning a messenger, one chosen and sent with a special commission as the fully authorized representative of the sender, much like we have the power of attorney today. An apostle in that day And Peter's establishing the fact that he's not a fly by night. He's not just some fellow who's passing by, and he won't be back this way again, but he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And who is he apostle to? To the strangers scattered throughout, and then he mentions the countries of Asia Minor. So he is especially sent of God, ordained of God, to instruct those who are scattered out, the strangers. And who's he talking about when he says strangers? Well, he's talking about those who were Jews of the dispersion. Because you remember in the Babylonian dispersion, Jews went out through the van known world, and only a small percentage of them came back at the end of the 70 years. So Jews lived throughout that part of the world because they set up themselves in business. They got established. Their roots were down, as it were, in the soil. And they didn't come back when Cyrus of Persia sent 
6,000 back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. And evidently, as the word of God went out after Christ established the church and the Holy Spirit moved upon the peoples, the Jews, they were converted. They became Christians. And so Peter is writing to the strangers scattered or the scattered strangers who were Jews of the dispersion. They were the elect or the converted Jews. Verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect what? Well, let's just take a little look and see what we have here. There are four elects that I want to share with you. Yes, one, all Christians who are born again are elect. Two, Israelites in their period of time are the elect. Three, anyone chosen of God at any time, Jew or Gentile, is the elect of God. And then, of course, Christ was the elect of God. He was specifically elected of God to do something special. But in verse 2, elect, and he's talking about the strangers that are scattered throughout Pontius, so forth. Verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. In other words, he's saying here, to these who were saved, converted, born again, baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, and then through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, that blood sanctified and set apart those who believed in him. And so Peter is making this very definite here, that he's talking to those who are chosen of God. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll note that God is both the Father and the God of Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, God's abundant mercy, hath begotten us again, meaning that we're born again. God, through his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God put a stamp of approval upon Jesus Christ and everything that Christ did by raising Christ from the dead. God put his stamp of, appro of approval upon what happened there in Jerusalem when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so this goes back to the reason for our lesson that Christians knowing they have been chosen by God for a magnificent future, may rejoice in this hope in the midst of earthly trials and tribulations. So Peter's establishing without a shadow of doubt that we have something the world doesn't have. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. In other words, we're talking about something that's permanent, something that is very permanent. Because God the Father manifested his approval of the redemption wrought by God the Son by raising him from the dead, a hope for possibility became a living hope. Before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything was a was a possibility. In other words, it hadn't been done before. No one had actually seen it. That's why the resurrection of Christ was doubted by numbers of people and why there have been all kinds of ideas put forth as to what actually happened. But because Christ was resurrected from the dead, my friends, now we have a positive religion. We have a positive assurance we have a definite something that absolutely surpasses all boundaries of the human mind. 
And this is very emphatically brought out here. In verse 4, talking about the inheritance, this inheritance is incorruptible. It cannot change because there are no forces within it that can cause such an effect. It is undefiled and it is unfading. What we have reserved for us in heaven in the form of a permanent, eternal inheritance, it's waiting for us. No force on the face of this earth can rob us of that inheritance. We are Christians. We are born again. We have been taken by the third person of the divine Godhead, the Holy Spirit, and we have been baptized into the body of Christ. And we have an eternal inheritance in the heavens reserved for us that fadeth not away. Therefore, we're not basing our religion or our redemption or our hope on something that we can't touch or feel or have no assurance for. Because God has given us this book. And this book is his word. And this book will never fail because it's the enduring, eternal Word of God Almighty. And so we are secure in Jesus Christ. We're chosen by God, verses 1 through 4. The second part of our first outline here, the B part, is we're kept by God, and that deals with verse 5. And we'll notice in verse 5 it says, Who are kept? by the power of God. In other words, this is a military expression, meaning a garrison or a guard or a number of soldiers watching or standing watch over us. We are kept. We are under the surveillance of God Almighty at all times. We are observed by the angels of God. The Bible talks about our guardian angels. The Holy Spirit is with us, supervising us, watching over us, caring for us, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Now, what does he mean, unto salvation? Well, let me show you briefly a threefold salvation. Number one, the believer now has salvation and is saved from all sin. Verse 5 is saying this, that we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. The believer is saved from the penalty of sin at Calvary. Presently, that was past tense, presently the believer is being kept now, daily, hourly, is being kept from sin as he walks the pilgrim pathway. And thirdly, the believer will eventually be saved from all of the Adamic sins and all of the results of the Adamic fall. Past tense on Calvary, saved from the penalty of sin. Presently, being saved from the habit of sin. Future, we will conform to the very image of Jesus Christ and then we will no longer carry the Adamic likeness and then our salvation will be utterly complete. Three stages. Past, present, future. And this is what he's emphasizing here in verse 5. We are kept, or who are kept, by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, revealed in the last time, the day will come when we will stand yonder at the very throne of God. We're in this lovely room at this hour, comfortable, Everything about this room is conducive to a beautiful hour of studying the Word of God. But when that hour comes, ready to be revealed in the last time, we will stand yonder around the great white throne of God. And we would have run our race. We would have been through all the trials and all the tribulations and all of the misunderstandings 
and all of the aches and the pains and all of those things that go with physical life, in the last time we will stand there and the race will be over, be finished. Kept by God. This is Bible. This is not denomination. This is Bible. We are kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So the keeping is God's problem. And he'll keep us. Jesus Christ prayed there in the garden that not one of these little ones be lost. The Bible further says that it is the will of the Father that not one perish. God doesn't want anybody outside the ark of the safety. He wants every person to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. The third part of our first point in our outline is tested by God. This has to do with verses 6 through 9. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to Jews who live in pagan lands. These Jews were scattered throughout the pagan lands, and at that particular time, they were under the heel of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was a tremendous persecutor of the Christians. And there were all kinds of restrictions. And things of that nature imposed upon the Jewish converts who had left Judaism, and to leave Judaism alone was enough, because even in that day when a Jew was converted, his family ostracized him and cut him off completely. Verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness. In other words, you're being grieved with many kinds of trials, all kinds of problems, hounded from pillar to post, persecuted, reviled, spat upon, censored in the land in which they lived. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And that's the history of the Christian. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs and look at the history of persecution of the early Christian church up to just a few hundred years ago. Christians by the millions have laid down their lives, bled and died for the cause of Christ. They were doing that in the day in which Peter was writing this letter. Verse 7 that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Now, he's talking about the faith of the individual. Our faith is all tried. Day by day, we have our faith tested. Now, in some parts of the world, they have it tested more severely than we do in this country, because this is probably one of three or four choice countries in all of the world in which to live. Because we have a living standard here that's higher, not, as the, not the highest in the world, but is one of the highest in the planet Earth. And we don't have our faith tried and tested like a lot of people that live on this planet. But yet we do stand trials and testings and temptations, and he's bringing that out here as he writes to these Christians, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, talking about their faith, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, at that time, at the appearing of Jesus Christ, it will be manifest what rewards men will have in the future kingdom. I made this statement a number of times. I've really never heard anybody else make it. But I make a statement every once in a while. You will serve in the millennial kingdom accordingly as you serve God now in this age. And it's rather interesting, but this is what Peter is saying here. 
in the middle of verse 7. Though it be tried with fire, talking about your faith, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, he's talking about at the coming of Jesus Christ at the second advent. He's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about when Christ comes back to this earth in bodily form to reign on this earth for a thousand years. Because those who serve him now as born-again believers are going to serve him then as ambassadors. And accordingly, as we serve God now, and we love him, and we do those things which are pleasing to him, accordingly, we will eventually serve him in the future kingdom of the millennial age, accordingly as we've done here what we should do. That's what he's bringing out here in the end of verse 7, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And you'll notice here he mentions something about gold. It's rather interesting. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. In other words, fire only separates all of the foreign and impure materials from gold. In other words, when they refine gold or silver, but he's talking about gold. When they refine gold, they only take out the dross, the impurities. All of the ore impurities that are in the chemical gold are removed until you have the pure gold and it can become a liquid. God is actually purifying us. And you'll have to admit, if you're growing anything at all in the Lord, you are a better Christian this year than you were last year. You love him more now than you did last year. So the refining process is going on. And it goes on daily, hourly. And Peter's bringing this out here about the trial of your faith. He's bringing that to a conclusion. Verse 8, whom having not seen, now he's talking about Christ, whom having not seen ye love, none of us have ever seen Christ. We've never seen any pictures of him. We've never felt him. We've never heard his voice, that is, in an audible sound. Now, some person may say, I have, but the Bible doesn't say that. We must stick by the word. And I know people write me all the time and they say, Jesus woke me up in the middle of the night and he told me so and so. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, this is where your faith comes in, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Haven't seen him, haven't heard him, haven't felt him, but I'm looking forward to meeting him. Looking forward to having a relationship with him that will, pre that will present an unspeakable joy full of glory. And in that hour when we see him, and I believe that every true believer in that hour, if we have achieved any degree of success, or we have received any crown of glory that we'll be willing to lay them at his feet and say, Christ, Jesus Christ, you deserve all the honor and all the glory because he purchased our salvation on that middle tree almost 2,000 years ago. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So we're looking forward to that day when the end of this journey will be over. All of the trials and the testings and the temptations and the sacrifices, the aches and the pains and the misunderstandings and the hard words, and all of that will be over. According to verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, meaning to say, at that hour, the whole plan is finished. We're there. Now, that was point one. It had A, B, and C. A, chosen by God. B, kept by God. C, tested by God. Now, the second point is predicted grace in verses 10 through 12. And this is what we are really involved in 
watch it carefully, verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. All of the prophets in the Old Testament for hundreds of years looked forward to the very thing that we are almost ready to take a hold of at this hour, the coming of Messiah, Jesus Christ. Way back in the Old Testament when they read these prophecies or they wrote these prophecies concerning Messiah, they had not the slightest idea how this was going to happen. In fact, some of them thought there would be two Messiahs. Because they couldn't understand how one person, one Messiah, could come and do both things outlined for Messiah. How could Messiah come and die and be resurrected and finish doing the things? In other words, they didn't understand the sufferings and they didn't understand the glory. They couldn't see how one Messiah could do both the sufferings and the glory. And that's what he's bringing out here in verse 10. And he reminds you, he's stabilizing the Jews who are dispersed among the nations of the Roman Empire in the first century A.D., of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. In other words, they carefully and diligently sought the truth of the things that they were prophesying because many times those prophets, when they said something, didn't really understand what they were saying. How could they? Paul, the apostle, makes some of these things clear in his great analytical teachings in the New Testament, in the books that he wrote. And he explained these things. And Peter, you remember on one occasion said why Paul says things that are hard to understand. And imagine the prophets writing 1,000, 2,000 years before Jesus Christ. They couldn't understand all of these things. And Peter is bringing this out. He's comforting the dispersed Jews of that day by saying, now don't get upset, you don't understand everything. The prophets didn't understand everything. They didn't comprehend everything meaning to to encourage them that it's, it's not necessary that you understand everything, and evidently they didn't, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They couldn't understand it. They did not know the time of the sufferings of Christ or by whom neither the glory to follow the sufferings. So what we're doing here is the predicted grace. Salvation was going to come eventually, but in the process of it coming, the prophets of that day and age couldn't make it clear to the people. Verse 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. It was a new covenant This gospel, which was preached unto you, the middle of verse 12, it was a new covenant and its full blessings that the prophets foretold. It was something new. You see, they were living under the Mosaic law. They had been almost 1,500 years plus. Some writers say 1,600 years. They had been living under the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law, originally ten laws, Two tables of stone made into 496 laws by the permission of God, by Moses, and then into 5,000 traditions of men. And the Jews have taken the traditions of men and they have formulated their own plan of Scripture and they've, they've put together their own concept of what God wants, basing it most of all upon the traditions of men and not upon the Word of God. 
the fullness of grace and the fullness of the Holy Spirit anointing upon believers. This is the new covenant. The full gifts and fruit of the Spirit and the complete redemptive acts and process of which the law was a shadow were all predicted by the prophets. Everything that's happening was predicted by the prophets, but they didn't understand it. The way into the holiest by the blood of Christ, the power and authority of every believer to do the works of Christ, and many other truths and experiences were unknown to the prophets. Let's look at holy living, which is our third point. It has uh, two sec- three sections underneath it. One is future glory, B is divine command, and C, costly redemption. But A, future glory, verse 13. What about it? Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, in those days, men wore not the clothes like we wear today, but they wore a type of a coat. You might call it a dress, but they wore a coat. A long garment that came down to almost the, to the ground or to the floor. And in order for a man to uh, go into battle or a man to run and catch somebody or do something, he had to reach down and get the garments, as it were, and he would tie them around him. And that's why they have this phrase, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, don't have a lot of strangly non-effectual projects or things dangling in your mind to clutter up your work for God. That's what he's saying. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, intelligently sober. He's not talking about drinking alcoholic beverages. Think clearly. Analyze the thing. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what's he talking about? We are looking forward to the day when Christ will be revealed. Now, he has made his appearance already. He made his appearance when he came as a little baby in Bethlehem's manger. That's when he appeared but he's going to be revealed. And when he's revealed, the whole world will know about him. But isn't it rather interesting that Satan has created a like parallel with the Antichrist? In the Apostle Paul's discussion of the Antichrist, he talks about the appearing of the man of sin, and then he talks about the revelation of the man of sin. In this study of 1 Peter chapter 1, we're talking about the appearing of Christ, and Peter is also talking about the revelation of Christ. The Antichrist appears, then sometimes later he is revealed. What reveals him? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 tells us what reveals him. He is revealed when he goes into the Jewish temple and tells the world that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Two different things. The appearance of the Antichrist, the revelation of the Antichrist. The appearance of Christ, he came as a little babe. The revelation of Christ, what will be the revelation? In the book of 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1, 7. When he shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Everybody in the world that's lost, everybody that refuses to acknowledge Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Everybody that has no acknowledgement of God the Father, he's coming back to reveal himself to take vengeance on them. So it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. 
Verse 8, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And people write me all the time and they say, Brother Estep, do you think so-and-so, naming a certain group of people, do you believe they're saved? I say, what do they teach? Well, they teach this, that, and the other thing, and none of that's in the Gospels. None of that's according to the blueprint of God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to be revealed when he comes back to take vengeance upon those kind of people. Now, we're not stretching the word. We're not prejudiced. We're not narrow-minded. We're just taking this book at face value. Peter never used symbolic language. He just talked right down the middle of the road. No symbolic language with Peter. Future glory, verse 13. We saw that. The second part of the third point, divine command, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance. In other words, we are to conform to another's example. We are not to fashion ourselves according to the former lusts. We're not to do now what we used to do because what we used to do, we did it because we were ignorant of the word. So now we lead a different life. We do different things. We manage our businesses different. We have a whole new outlook on life because then we were ignorant and we did those things which glorified the flesh. Now we have new knowledge and we do those things which glorify God. That's what he's saying here in verse 14. Verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. In other words, paganism, under which these scattered Jews were living, paganism scarcely produced a God whose example was not the most abominable. The gods that the pagan peoples worshipped usually were gods of licentiousness, gods which led them into all kinds of adulterous living and things of that nature. And he's saying here in verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, God has called us, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Lastly, the costly redemption, verses 17 through 21. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. In other words, if you call on God through Christ and profess to be obedient children, pass your time here in reverence and fear. Now, not fear that you're afraid of God, but this word fear is literally translated in awe. In awe. Holy. God is holy. He's righteous. He's pure. He's everything that is absolute when it comes to righteousness. And so we stand not in fear. Actually, it's a mis representation. We stand in awe of God. And what does he say in verse 17? And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear because God doesn't respect any person individually. God will judge every one of us equally. God will give each one of us an opportunity to do what we want to do for him, and he will never retard any individual favoring one over another. God doesn't do that. He is no respecter of persons. Verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, I'll say we were not, 
as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. We were not redeemed with corruptible things. We were not purchased in the slave market with blue chip stamps. We have not been permitted to walk in heavenly places and have our name written in the Lamb's book of life with things which are corruptible. But verse 19 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Under the Mosaic law, whenever they offered a sacrifice, they took the best lamb. Had to be perfect. It couldn't be crippled. It couldn't be blind in one eye. It couldn't be the runt. It had to be the best. And that's what God gave, the best. From the very threshold of heaven came his only begotten son down to a world scarred with 4,000 years of war and sin and corruption and vice. And Jesus Christ laid off his robes of righteousness and hung them in the heavenly cloakroom and came down to this world and took on the flesh of a human being. Made in the womb of woman just like any other person and came into this world, the pure, perfect, spotless Lamb of God. And then he went out to Calvary, and the cruel Roman army put him to death. The executioners, who carried out the form of capital punishment, crucifixion, and they put him to death. And the Roman soldier unsheathed his spear and stuck it into the side thinking that the water and the blood would come out and Christ would die sooner. But he opened up a fountain for the whole of the human race. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel, God with us, from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. How long was eternity? I don't know. When did the divine Godhead sit down at the table and work out the plans for this earth? And work out the plans for Jesus Christ dying for sinners. I don't know how long ago it was. But it's sometime in the distant past. The Bible says it was foreordained that Christ should die for us. Says that in verse 20. Who was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, in these last times, 2,000 years ago, he was manifest for us, he came and he died for us, and he shed his blood for us. Verse 21, who by him do believe in God? What do you mean, who by him do believe in God? Four things Christians believe. One, they believe in God through Christ. Two, in the bodily resurrection of Christ. Three, in the ascension and exaltation of Christ, for that their faith and hope are based upon the works of Christ. He said on one occasion, believe me for my very work's sake. Whatever he did, it's a Bible as far as we're concerned. He told them when he was living here, believe me for the works that I do. No man has ever done the things that I do. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. God put the stamp of approval upon Christ. Everything Christ did, God approved it. Christ didn't do a single thing that God wasn't pleased with. And then when they slew Christ, Now, Peter's giving this to dispersed Jews living all over the Roman Empire. But he's also giving it to us. 
Everything that Christ did, God was pleased with it. And then when they put Christ to death, placed him in a tomb, the Roman garrison established watch at the tomb, and they put a seal on the stone that was rolled in front of the door. And then at the end of the third day, three days and three nights, because the Bible says as Jonas was in the stomach or in the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That had to come to pass. And he was there, dead, physically dead. He was as dead as any other Jew that ever died. But then God put his stamp of approval upon Christ because Christ said, if you destroy this temple in three days and three nights, I'll raise it up again. And they thought he was talking about Herod's temple. He wasn't. He was talking about the body. You destroy this body, and in three days and three nights, I'll raise it up again. And after the three days and the three nights had transpired, they started going to the tomb, and they found it empty. The stone was still there. He had come out of the tomb before the stone was ever rolled away. They rolled the stone away to let the people look in. He had already come out. He had a body that could pass right through matter. And that's going to be our lot. When he comes back to be revealed in flaming fire to bring judgment upon those who know not God and who worship not Jesus Christ and have no part of the Christian way of life. 